Hey everybody, hope everyone's doing well. Let me just check the sound really quick. And it looks like the sound's working. <clears throat> so typically on these videos, my my preference is it's really just kind of it's a QA, <clears throat> ideally over trading related things in the trading course. But I'm open really to for the majority any sort of questions. So I'm going to start looking through and just taking a second reading through questions and feel free to ask any questions through the comments and we'll go from there. Give me just a few seconds. Though. I want to adjust something on the sound. Okay, I'm reading through <clears throat> the questions right now. And I do appreciate everybody joining on a Sunday. Okay, so the first question, while swing trading, watching my profits turn into losses, I have developed a relatively bad habit of taking small profits early. How do I change? How do I stop doing that? Do you also face this early days of your trading? I think everybody faces that. And the more you understand about price action, the more traders can find the right balance. Let me... And before, what I'm gonna I'm gonna take one second and turn on a bar counter. So give me just a moment here, because we do we definitely need that. I had to I reinstalled TradeStation over the weekend, so hopefully that fixed all of the issues. But I've got the bar counter right here on my computer. Just need one more second. I'm making the text a little bit bigger. And now I'm reloading it. There we go. So, so the question with swing trading and watching profits turn into losses, how do you prevent taking profits too early? The first way is work on swing trading. So whenever you find a move, and there's several ways to do it. One is if you can trade the SPY allow yourself to take your profits in maybe lots of three so scale out three times but a lot of traders it really has to do with light counting when you get a strong sell-off like this the odds are you're going to get somewhat of an equal distance second leg and that's why it's really important to understand the concept of always in and the way i look at it is <clears throat> there's really two types of, of moves there's a major move which is in essence a trend and there's a minor move which is something that's a leg in a trading range. So these moves in here, these are all minor. In here, this is minor. But when you have set consecutive sell climaxes all the way down here, that's a major 
this has a chance to lead to a major reversal. And a major reversal is typically something that's going to last for a reasonable amount of bars and at least two legs. And typically it's going to be, you know, maybe two hours. But if you've been selling off for about 30 or 40 bars, a major reversal would be something that's lasting at least 20, 30 bars. But the way I, the way I look at that is if I'm buying above a bar like 16, and you get a strong follow through bar, like if I'm buying above 15 and you get a strong follow through bar 16, but then you start to go sideways here and you get a bear bar closing on its low, I'd get out. And if you really want to work on maximizing profit, force yourself to exit below and above bull bars. So if you're buying, wait for a bear bar to get out below. If you're selling, wait for a credible bull bar. And maybe that's here, or maybe, you know, technically you get out above this bull bar, but it's still going to be minor. So it didn't trigger and then maybe you get out down here and the way you can practice that is just looking through lots of days let me just fix really quick the trend lines i got those and one way to do that is just to scroll through a lot of bars. I need to make the number of number of days back longer. I tell you, we just have it defaulted to about seventy five days. So I've just scroll back, and right here, if you are swing trading. Here's the start of the day. At some point, you decide. Maybe in here, it's always in long, but it's a little bit parabolic. Maybe you get out below a bear bar closing on its low, or you get out a couple of points below this bar. This is not enough to be a major reversal. And then here, still going sideways. Maybe you, you buy here, stop below. And if you were going to do that, if you're going to buy, stop below here, just get out below a bear bar closing on its low. Here, why not get out there? Because this was strong enough for a second leg. Is this strong enough to get out below? Some traders might, or maybe they get out a couple of points below. And then with it going sideways there, some traders would get out. So what about selling the close of this bar? Some might, it's a strong enough bar for a second leg. Others would rather see a break below the moving average. Is that enough of a break below the moving average? No. The bar barely closed below the moving average, so traders probably need one more bar. And because they needed one more bar, bulls bought. And this is not really an easy swing trading day because it's a trading range here, trading range here. So I'm trying to find an example. If you were short here, maybe you just get out below a bear bar. So some traders, they sell somewhere in here and they just trail a stop. One of the ways I would trail a stop is sell the close, maybe a stop a couple of points above the bar. Or, uh, I got to fix this real quick. So let me just take a second to do that. So we'll turn that off, turn off the labels. I always forget which one that is. I think it's the trend line. Yep. And then now that's set the way it needs to be. I want the trend line to really be red. Better. So here, maybe a measured move. Almost up to here, but a, maybe half the range of the bar up. And if you're short, you just keep trailing a stop until you get until the market goes a couple of points above. But we'll talk more about always in here in just a little bit. Okay, question: How do you anticipate what to expect from today's session by looking at higher time frame charts like the daily or weekly? And then further question: What preparations do you do in the morning before the open of the session? 
Well, as you know, I write the blog just about every day in the morning. So that's a little bit in a way of preparing because I have to look at the daily chart. I don't have the same charts up right now because I'm going to, I got to recreate them. I decided to delete all of the workspaces I use and just rebuild them because I think one of them is corrupted and it was causing issues. But for me, you know, it's like what I talked about. I know on the daily chart, I'm performing somewhat of a bear breakout below the channel. It's not ideal. It's breaking below the channel, but also think that we're going to test this breakout point, which is the low of October the 3rd right here. And because of that, I think that we're going to start to go sideways on the daily chart. Now, before any of that, what's more important? What's more important is let's just pick a random day where we don't understand the context. So I'm going to go to here and I'm going to scroll to the right until we get to the next day. There's the first, there's the open of the day. So when we look at this chart, what are the first things we're going to look at? One of the first things I'm going to look at is the obvious. And let me, I do want to test out and see. What the scaling should be on these bars. Or what the weight of the bars should be. A little too much. I didn't think about that losing my place. Pretty sure it's somewhere in here. Anyways, the prior session, it was a triangle. It's right here, so we'll use this day. Okay, so it's a bull bar. So when you look at this session, what's the first thing we're going to do? I'm going to take the prior day's low right here. And I'm also going to take the prior day's high. Because those are going to be parts of one will be support, the other will be resistance. And the odds are the market will test one or the other. <clears throat> The next thing I look for is a gap. So I look for, is the market gapping down far? Is the gap small? Here, the gap's pretty small. It's not all that big. And because the gap's small, there's an increased risk that the gap is going to close here in the first hour, maybe hour and a half. And then, other than that, I look at the bar. I look at the first bar. Is the first bar a trend bar? Is it a trading range bar? Here, it's a bull bar. So I know that the bulls will buy above it put a stop below. That's a low probability trade. But if we get a bull bar, another bull bar, another bull bar, that might be the breakout of a channel or a breakout of a tight trading range. Doji, not so far, not trending. But what I'm looking for on the trend, on the open, is I'm looking for a trend. I'm expecting the market not to form a trend, but I'm looking for one. And then I'm assuming we're going to go sideways for a lot of bars every day. Here, we're starting to break out to the upside. So is it by the close? It might be. It's in the middle of the range. I can take a chance. Maybe we need one more bar, and then I buy the close of this bar, stop below, even though it's climactic. Odds are the first reversal down should fail. Here, starting to go sideways, getting a second leg, but near the high of the day. Probably the start of a channel, so probably still going to go higher. Now we're breaking above the highs and stop maybe down here or a couple of points below here. And you can see we're just channeling up and I'm going to turn on. Let me turn the screen off for half a second. I want to turn the bar counter on for every day. But to answer your question, what I look for is I'm always looking at the prior day, the close of the prior day. And next, think back to Al's trading the open videos. I'm looking for is the market have a big gap? And I'm always expecting, I say it in the blogs, the market's either going to form a trading range or a trend from the open. And there's an 80% chance of a trading range open and a 20% chance of a trend from the open. When you're trading, one of the things that's really, really important to do is to understand how to distill down information, especially if you're trading as a discretionary trader, just looking at a chart. There's a lot of information you have to think about and there's a ton of decisions you have to make. And if you cannot rule out enough decisions quick enough, 
you will not have enough time to trade a five minute chart. You'll run out of time. That's why a lot of traders, they take a trade and let's just go to a random place. They'll take a trade. Let's say, here's a good one. It's kind of an extreme example, but they buy and then they see this big bar right here. And then they see this bar and they weren't, they were not prepared for this. So they just get frozen in place. And rather than understanding if they reverse to short, they're going to make up more, probably more than what they lost. They instead stay long. Or another example, they buy the close of this bar, but then when it goes sideways, they don't know what to do. So when you're trading, you know, it's kind of the example of there's two type, there's two ways to trade. There's a purely discretionary trader, someone like Al. And I use someone like Al because basically Al could trade any way he wants to. There's no, there's no limits. He knows he understands how to trade just about any possible way. Scalping, swing trading, he can buy above bars, he can enter on limit orders. Nothing will phase him. And nothing will phase him because it's his experience is so high that he's just he's prepared for just about anything. It's kind of like if you've if you've driven a you know NASCAR or you've been a Formula One driver for 10 years. It's going to be very easy to just drive a normal car because your reflexes are going to be very, very sharpened as opposed to someone who's never driven a car and you expect them to be a Formula One driver. It's just not going to happen. So the point with that is a lot of traders, when they're starting out, they have to have a way to be prepared with as little bits of with as little pieces of information as possible. So if everyone that has the video course, I would recommend Take the trend, take the trading range open videos in the how to trade section and really understand it. Understand, understand how to categorize the, the open. Is the market in a trend from the open or a trading range open? What are the characteristics of a trend from the open? What are the characteristics of a trading range open? If you can figure out those pieces, you're going to be in a really, really good spot. And that's also gets into the subject of really understanding a couple of things. So start with the open, understand everything you can about the open, and then focus on understanding everything you can about the middle. And then after that, focus on everything about the end of the day. And that basically gets down to break the video course up into pieces. Question in Al's trading room. Al's trading room focuses focuses mostly on a scalper's reading all day long, and this is often, and this often causes me to have analysis paralysis. You have analysis paralysis. It's not because of it's a scalper's reading all day long. The reason why you have analysis paralysis is you're probably hoping for a swing trade that has a higher probability than you think. So what do I mean by that? At any given moment. The probability is very close to 50 50. It might be slightly better for the bulls or slightly better for the bears at any given at any given point. But if you buy above this bar, there's probably a little bit better than 40% that it's going to lead to a large swing. But what's the probability it's going to go up for a couple of legs before it reverses? It's probably about it's probably more than 50%. And that's what confuses traders. The probability of a sideways market is really, really high. And the probability of this. We just get this large trend is actually much lower. That's why when you hear I'll talk about major trend reversals, 40% of the time you get a large swing lasting, you know, two legs and several bars leading to a large profit. 60% of the time you get a small winner or a small loser. So if you take a lot of stop entries in a trading range, 60% of the time you're going to make small winners and small losers, especially if you can get out really fast. 40% of the time, you're going to catch a large move. Now, is it is it exactly 60% is it, is, is it exactly 40? No. If you're going to be a discretionary trader, you have to have a way to figure out what is good enough and then take the trade. If you're a computer or an algorithm, you can spend all day and have the most complex way of distilling what the price action could be. But if you're just eyeballing the chart, you do not have the time to decide, is it 60% or is it 59% or is it 64%? You just have to decide what's good enough and then take the trade.
and then follow up. So I never know when it's a good swing entry. When he says he wouldn't buy, is it only for a scalp or could a swing trade enter? A swing trader could always enter above any bar. And as a swing trader, how do I better understand the trading room? Well, I talk a lot about always in trading. And I talk about always in trading almost every, in I pretty much every end of day review that I do. So I would start with the YouTube videos at the end of the day and start listening to what I talk about with always in. Next, look at the trading room. And what, you're, what you'll notice is the swing direction. First off, I'm assuming you've watched the video course, but if you're looking for the swing direction, it usually changes back and forth until it's clear. The way I look for a swing, look at the moving average. If the bars are mostly below the moving average, the bar, in order for the market to change directions, there needs to be closes above the moving average. And ideally, I want to see at least two or three closes above the moving average here after consecutive sell climaxes. But you get better at swing trading by practicing swing trading. You're not going to get a high probability swing. It's just never going to happen. But you can get a 45 or 50% probability swing that could go pretty far. Question, Al mentions to learn to read the price action footprints left behind by institutional traders, but he is aware of footprint imbalance charts. I'm not sure what you mean by that, but yes, the footprint is the price action. The price action cannot be hidden. So if we're looking at the weekly chart of what the institutions are doing, they can't hide the fact that this is a trading range. They can't hide the fact that there's open gaps here and that we had a sell off another one in another breakout. And this is possibly a bear breakout below a bull flag. The institutions can't hide that. That's what I was talking about. And the more, the other important thing with that is for every bear, bearish institution that's shorting, hoping for a sell off down here, there's a bullish institution buying and scaling in, hoping for the opposite. And that's not just for the weekly chart. That's for the daily chart, the one minute chart, the five minute chart. Always assume there's an institution doing the opposite. Question. You mentioned once that Al took a loss in the trading room and that he was totally unfazed. And then he started to scalp aggressively to recover. Do you remember the date so I can buy the video archive? There's a lot. I mean, I don't remember the exact moment, but he, he talked a lot about that. And what I mean by that is everybody is going to take at least a couple of ticks, a few ticks losses. And what Al is saying is he had the ability. So let's say Al bought the low of this bar and he took a dumb trade buying high in the range. And then he saw 21 he would have the ability to just reverse and go short to make up the position. And that gets into understanding what you're doing. Al calls it, <clears throat> when you hear Al talk about how a trader can often reverse their position if the trade is not working, that goes into one's understanding of that situation. That's why a lot of traders, if they can just understand really, really well those one or two setups that they're working on, they can figure out how to reverse their position. So if you knew, if you knew the odds were this is a wedge bottom and we should get 10 bars and two legs, what happens if you get a downside breakout? Or like here, you know, let's say we had this example a couple of weeks ago. But we can find it. It's not that far away. But before then, I gotta change the scaling because it's a little. Here we go. This was the example right here. So spike and channel, even though it's parabolic and the market starts to sell off, some traders would see this as a 20 gap bar buy and in, in, in the need for a retest. But at some point, 42, 43, maybe 45, traders begin to believe the opposite, that this is an endless pullback. So it traps traders on the wrong side. And if you reverse your position, you would make up what you lost. Would you please enlighten us on limit order trade management, risk management to be specific? Well, that's not that simple because 
A limit order trader is going to lose when a stop order trade works or when a breakout trade works. So if you're a limit order, the opposite of a limit order trade is a, is a stop entry trade. And the way you understand limit order trading is understanding where the limit order traders are trapped. So if you sold above six, sold above seven, and then you see this big breakout, eight and nine, guess what? You know limit order traders are trapped. And if you can understand this is what I would give a challenge for everybody. Understand what a strong breakout is and why they're so important. Strong breakouts lead to second legs. And as many of you know, a second leg, a breakout leading to a second leg, especially if it's a leg one, has a very high probability of happening and it's upwards of 90%. There's a 90% chance this breakout is going to get at least a brief pause and second leg at a minimum. And that happens all the time. And because of that, the traders that are... <clears throat> and because of that, the traders that are short, you know that those traders who are short are trapped. And because there's the odds favor a second leg, they're going to get out. Someone says, but on a candlestick chart, you can't see the actual orders that were transacted. That's true. But what are you going to do? If I hand you all the orders to the E-mini, what are you going to do with the information? Some traders are better than others at reading order flow, but most traders are going to have difficulty reading it. And just look at the chart. The chart will give you a lot of information. Okay, let's look at some other questions. Okay, question. So when I was watching the Brooks Trading Course yesterday and Al mentioned follow, following the footprint of institutions, I'm thinking to myself, I literally use footprint charts. Uh, we already talked about that. Okay, reading through questions. Okay, this is a question about partial profits. I assume at the point of taking at least partial profits, the trader's equation has become less favorable to stay in because the distance to the stop has become too big. Yeah, the reason why traders take partial profits is in a trading range, gaps close. So let's look at a trading range. All the way here. Well, that's not, that didn't exactly happen, but let's say, you know, pick anywhere in here. You sell above this high, you scale in, or if you, you buy above bar 12, eventually the market came right back to your stop. Even if you sold in here, bars 39 or 40. Look what happened later in the day. If you sold the close at 39, eventually later in the day, you'd have been stopped out break even. So a lot of traders take their profits because they know that the market as a whole does a lot of this. We've been trending over the past several days. But let's say you bought Say you bought the close of this big bull bar here, right where this line is. So you bought the breakout above and you held for several bars. Look what happened. Eventually, you're negative. So if you held for too long and the market went sideways, it reversed. I talked about that. I've talked about over the past few days, the euro versus the dollar.
And now for some reason, this is going to act up on me. So let me try this really quick. Logging back into Trade Station right now. The reason why you take partial profits is because if you do not take partial profits, the market's going to come back to your original entry most of the time. Plus, the odds always favor, the odds are higher that you can enter on a pullback. So let me look at the rest of your question. So why not take full profits? How does being half in, half out Partial profits make sense from the perspective of the trader's equation. The equation is either positive or negative. Well, a lot of traders will build positions. And, you know, obviously here, <clears throat> let's use the example of Right here, the stronger the breakout, the more traders are willing to sell and hold onto their shorts. But when the market gets more confusing, the quicker traders are to take profits. A lot of traders do what you're talking about right here. They'll enter and then just exit the, the full position. So they sell the close and scalp out. And then when this bar closes, they look to sell again. That's a pretty common way to handle a trade. And the trade taking partial profits does not work against you, especially if you can get in pretty quick or re-enter the trade quickly. Question, even though I traded on a five-minute chart, should I keep checking on how the other time frame bars are closing? If so, could you rec recommend some, please? Understanding the higher time frames can be helpful. Most traders should really focus on the chart in front of them. And if you're looking at all these charts, <clears throat> up here, here's a 60 minute chart, here's a 15 minute chart, here's a daily, and then here's a weekly. That's too much information to process. And I use this in the webinar or the trading room just so I can talk about all four or five charts. But if I'm trading, I want to look at this chart because this chart tells me everything I need to know. It can be helpful if you know that, for example, up here, Here's October the 11th and 12th. We're at a high on the daily chart, and that's resistance. That can be helpful, but you also know the market's in a trading range right here, and it might break to the downside. But for the most part, traders should just look at one time frame. How do you find the swing setup? Go to the trading, the open videos. And I'd really, that's what I'd like everybody to do. You know, one of my goals, what I really want with these videos in the future is not only Q&A, but also I want these videos to hopefully at some point soon start talking about some of the actual video course. So what if we did a webinar over trading the open with the video course? and everything to look for. But the first thing is you got to watch the video course. What is the key aspect in preparation for the week? I think the first key aspect is a, what are you looking to do in the week? So everybody kind of goes into, I mean, it's kind of like with a sport or if you play football or if you, if you ever watch football, there's always a game plan going into that week. So if you're going to look at a chart, you need to know what you're doing. 
mean, a lot of traders, they look at Al, and I've made this mistake a thousand times. They look at Al, and they see how he can almost take any trade. He can just basically, he just sits in his chair and then just does whatever he wants and can take a profitable trade. And the problem with that approach for most people is they don't have the information or the understanding of market in order to do that. Again, you know, it's kind of a fun little exercise, <clears throat> but take every bar. And for one, let me back up. Have you ever noticed how if you just look at a chart during the day or look at the market, and have no intentions of actually trading that day, how simple the price action looks. You keep thinking to yourself, yeah, this is pretty easy. I could just, you know, I sell the high of this bar, scale in, make money, buy down here, scale in, make money, buy this close, get out, break even. Maybe I sell here for two legs. I buy here for a second leg up, sell the high of the day. Maybe I sell here. And it seems so easy to do. But then why is it when you actually trade a day all of a sudden, it's kind of like when the entire game plan and your understanding of the market just completely goes out the window. And the reason is because your brain is getting overloaded with decisions. It cannot focus on what it needs to do. When you're just watching a chart and your only goal is to just diagnose what the chart's doing, there's, no, there's nothing on the line. You don't have to actually take a trade. And therefore, you don't have to manage a trade. So as far as preparation for the week, what I would challenge you, the person asking this question, is do you do you know what trade you're going to look for on the week? You know, what setups are you looking for? And there's really truth to that because everybody, even Al, Al has a setup and he has a, a series of setups that he thinks about. Now, the only challenge with someone like Al is his he has so many ways he can trade. And they're just, they're in the video course, they're in the books. There's all sorts of ways he can trade. And that's why a lot of people get frustrated when they look at the video course or his books and they say, yeah, but he's not actually teaching me a setup. He's teaching you how to read the market and understand the market, because if you can think of the market in the way he's explaining it, you'll understand how to trade basically any situation. The problem with that, though, is if you're going to trade any situation, you need to understand within split second what you're going to do, what's the probability, what's what the market should be doing in that situation. And then what are you going to do if it doesn't work in that situation? So you have to have a method, a methodical approach. So that's the first thing I would tell you. And that's why I keep saying trade the open and keep it simple. Don't trade the first hour. Wait for the mark. Wait for the market to form at least six bars, ideally 12 bars. And then when, once the 12th bar closes, figure out the opening structure, opening day structure. In other words, what's the day doing? And once you figure out what the day is doing, look for, keep it simple. Look for a double top or a double bottom or a wedge top or a wedge bottom to catch the opening swing. But the point is you've got to have some idea of what you're going to do before the market opens. So if you're going to trade always in, how are you going to trade always in? Are you going to look for second entries? Or are you just going to wait for a strong breakout with follow through? That's why a lot of traders... There are some traders that are profitable faster than other traders. And it's typically the ones that are profitable faster than other traders is they get really good at a few things that they're looking for every day. And then after a couple of years of being really good at those few things, they start being able to expand what all they're doing. Go back and listen to Al. There's a podcast of Al in 20, 2009. And he talks about basically what I'm saying. He started looking for, I think it was failed breakouts at the extreme of the day. So he would wait for the market to break above the, I guess, opening range and then refer and then fail. And then he would short and hold for a swing. And he'd do the same thing, wait for the market to break below and fail. And if it didn't, he'd let it go. And then all of a sudden that evolved into more, more and more different ways of price action.
So as far as preparation for the leak, what I look for is as soon as the chart, as soon as the day opens, A, I have my mindset, okay, I'm going to trade always in, okay? There's nothing to do on bar one, nothing to do on bar two or three. Second entry short, okay? That's at least a double top, so down and down, gapping up, testing the upper portion of a range, so maybe it reverses. Is it always in short? No. Is it always in short here? I think so, but it's... Let's see one more bar breaking below the moving average. Is it always in short here? Maybe. But there's probably sellers above. It looks like a wedge bottom. We could easily reverse. Maybe I sell a pullback. And then you can see that happen. Or you sell the close. But if you're selling the close and you get a bull bar, you have to decide to get out. And then here, tough call. But tight channel. Odds are this sell-off is going to get a second leg down. So some traders, they'll exit below and look to sell again. Or other traders, they just hold short, betting that the bulls will not get one more bar. And instead, they got a second leg down. That's how I think of trading the open. Here, tight trading range, failed breakout of the highs, reversal down. Is it always in short? Not yet. It's cons We're channeling up and we have an open gap here, possible open gap here. I do think this gap will close at the high. So I think we'll go a little bit lower, which we just did. Now, tight bear channel, probably sellers above and a second leg down. But you get a bull bar closing on its high. Maybe it's an expanding triangle, a failed breakout of the opening range here, failed to break out to the upside, now failed to break out to the downside, but the bulls still probably need more. And you can see they didn't get it. And instead we went sideways, tried to form a bottom and continued a little bit down. So as, again, what I'm implying is Let's talk. There's a few questions about what's your favorite method of studying, or you know, how do you how do you study? The first thing is you have to. Let's start with this question because it's actually a decent question. What's your favorite method? And and it's a topic that's worth discussing. What's your favorite method for studying? Well, obviously, the first method is you have to have a way. You have to at least finish the video course. So if you're asking questions about what's a double bottom, what's a double top and you haven't watched the video course, that's a problem. And really, you know, it, it's really not ideal if you haven't even watched the video course yet and you're listening to this live, that's not ideal. And <clears throat> what I would tell most people is, let me get a sip of water here. Anyways, what I would tell someone who has not watched the video course yet is realistically, I would stop watching this and start watching the video course until you finish the video course. Once you finish the video course, maybe come back to this video. But the first thing as far as studying, watch the video course. And I would plan on spending about a year. I mean, this is just being realistic. I think you have to spend about a year really studying Al in the video course until you even really remotely begin to understand the information. Once you've done that, what I would start doing is I would take a deep dive into the videos of trading the open and really understand all the nuances of the open. Don't worry about the middle of the day. Don't worry about the end of the day. Just worry about the open. And then start figuring out how could you trade the opening of the day. And I talk about it in the blogs. You can wait for a double bottom or a double top or a wedge bottom or a wedge top and then look for a way to buy. You can wait for a strong breakout with follow through and then look to buy. Other than that, it's a lot of time studying the video course. And what I would say is a lot of traders make the mistake of, of spending too much time. <clears throat> they don't have a game plan when they're trading. They just take the video course and say, Okay, I'm going to learn as much as possible in the video course. And if I can just learn as much as possible, I'll know how to trade. You will learn a lot of information. But the problem with trading is being able to take the information that you know in your brain and have it at a subconscious level. You know, just like with any of these bars, you have to know. Let's just look for something.
a lot of these bars form rather quickly. And if you're not ready, you can easily take a trade and get trapped on the wrong side. So the first thing for everybody is really study the videos and get to a point where you actually understand the video course. And that typically takes at least a year to actually understand it. And that doesn't mean the studying ends. It's, and then once you start, once you have a good grasp on the video course, start looking at a lot of charts, start understanding the open. The person that can think through more methodically what they're trying to accomplish at the end of the day, they're going to be better off. And that's why I'm hitting at look, spending a lot of time watching the open. If I've mastered the video course, do I still need to read Al's books? I've reached a very good level of understanding of the video course and the lingo of Al. Well, my first question to you is, there's a few things. One, why not read Al's books? Do you understand the video course well enough to where you can write your own series of Al's books? The point with that is there's always more to learn. So yes, I think you do need to read Al's books. My intentions is not to read the books. And my next step is to watch Al's trading room and live end of day videos that you have made on, on YouTube. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's fine. You know, as, as long as you're always learning more and expanding your knowledge, that's great. And do I agree with you as far as the trading room? Sure. I think what everybody should do is at a minimum, Everybody needs to get at least 30 day recording of Al, ideally a year's worth of recordings of Al, and at least study those. And then at some point, sure, join the trading room. That worked well for me. And I was probably in the trading room for several years, 2013 to probably past 2020. And that's what helped me really understand the way Al thinks about the market. You have to learn how to be really at peace with. The 40 60 rule and that's what screws up a lot of traders traders have a hard time believing that this sell-off right here could easily just be a sell vacuum and reverse up or that this rally could easily be a buy vacuum that reverses down but yes i think watching the live end of day videos watching the trading room all of that's good and as far as the books what I think is great about the books is try and read one chapter every other day or just a little bit, you know, pick up the books occasionally and just read a little bit. And that's kind of like the video course. You know, the video course is ideal. You want to watch the video course all the way through, of course. But then if you can watch one or two videos every day, and certainly at least one video every day, you're going to be in a really good spot several years down the road, especially if you're at least doing other things with your trading, if you're studying, looking at charts, but you definitely have to watch the video course a lot. How do you focus when watching the market? Sometimes it moves in a very tight range and I can't do anything. And then I lose my focus and miss the move. Yeah, that happens, but you're always going to miss moves. And the more you understand about the market, the more comfortable you'll be with missing moves. And who cares? I mean, if you, when you look at it, the market's usually not in such a tight range that it's untradeable. Like right here. Sold off, tight trading range, even here, big sell off, but this is late in the day. Bar one. Now we already, we hadn't talked about this day. Okay. So we rallied, breaking out to the upside here. It's always in long, but far from the moving average. Probably going to be a bull trend or a trading range day. Tight trading range right here. What do you do? Well, rally sideways, strong bull breakout, follow through, probably a second leg. Here, are sideways for a lot of bars. So do I want to buy? No, I'd rather wait and see a test of the moving average and see what happens. And if I miss the move, who cares? These days are not always that fun. Tight bull channel, breakout to the upside, but consecutive buy climaxes, it could easily reverse down. And you can see it took a while to reverse down and then eventually sold off. 
but you can always wait for the next day. So as far as tight trading ranges and having nothing to do, the more you study and learn, you'll find more and more things to do. I'm in the EST time zone, and in addition to the E-mini S&P, what do you think about trading the day session of the Australian Open? I ask because its session is 5.30 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. in the winter. You know, I know of traders who are really good traders, and they trade for two or three hours in a day. Some of them trade a 100-second chart. And they will trade, they'll take at least 15 or 20 day, 20 trades. And they will typically stop trading, even though they have the mental capacity to trade the entire day while watching a 100 second chart. And the point with that is, I think the more you trade, the more you realize that you really do not need all that much market time to really take good trades. So my question to you is, sure, you could trade the Australian Open, and I'm sure it would be a great market to trade. But what could you do? What is the opportunity cost that you're missing out with studying during that time? What if you traded in the morning and really honed in on trading the morning and then you spent the rest of the day studying or the rest of the evening studying? And that's kind of the problem. A lot of traders, and I'm, you know, again, I have no idea of this person's trading ability. They might be a very, very good trader and if that's the case, sure, go for it. But a lot of traders, if they would focus more and more and more on what they're doing and what exact setups they're trying to take and get really, really good at those, it's kind of like a factory. If you're going to start a factory or start a, you know, any product, your first, you know, your first goal is to create the product, prove it works, and then get it to market you know, actually have transactions of that product. And then if you can do that, you have a baseline of products, you at least have one product that works. And then what if you can, you know, if you can create a shirt, then you can create several shirts or, you know, maybe pants with it. But the point is a lot of traders spend too much time taking a lot of trades that end up being a lot of bad trades. So that's why I talk about the video course. I like to think of Al as an encyclopedia. He's almost documented his encyclopedia of knowledge. And that's why the encyclopedia of charts is just so, such a fitting title. But if you think about it, that's 30 years of information that you're trying to learn. So if you can, if you can find a way to say, okay, I'm going to get really good at swing trading. You know, Al says get really good at swing trading. But what if you could get really good at one type of swing trade? And then you could understand it extremely well. If you could understand that extremely well, what if you could understand how to trade the open? So if I could understand how to trade a trend from the open really well, then the opposite of a trend from the open is a trading range open. And then if I could understand how to trade a trading range open well, then maybe I can move on to something else. So if I could understand everything about the open that I could and how to trade it and get really, really good at trading the open, and not trade the middle or end of the day, then once I get really good at the open and I can figure out everything I need to know about the open, I can move to the middle of the day. I would do that because that will be far more effective with your time. You know, it's kind of like the, the Bruce Lee, for those of you that know who that is, getting really, really good at one thing and getting extremely good at it and then moving on to other pieces. But that also, what that means, and, and to be clear, what I mean by that is understand, devour everything about trading the open that Al has. You know, how much does Al talk about in the books about trading the open? How much, how, what are all the encyclopedia of charts that talk about trading the open? Collect all of that into, you know, some sort of outline or information and then memorize it and learn it where you can almost subconsciously, you just know what the open is typically going to do. Kind of like that rule, 50% of the time, there's a, on 50% of the time, whatever major move you get will reverse. That's really important. Okay, let's look for some more questions. What's an effective, effective way to study the encyclopedia? 
I think the effective way is first learn the video course, understand the video course and the mark and the overall terminology really well. Then go ahead and purchase the encyclopedia and study the outline. So there's a there's a Google sheet that has all of the information about what what is in the encyclopedia and just really focus on the chapters, focus on navigating it. I wouldn't focus on memorizing it. Once you can learn how to navigate it, where are the double tops? Where are the double bottoms? Where are the major trend reversals? Where are the trend from the opens or the gap up, gap down sections? Then you can start learning how to use it. I'm not sure what you mean by this question. Everything I'm talking about with Al is I'm just giving, you know, in some context, I'm just giving my own thoughts of what I learned, but I'm, I'm referring to everything of Al, you know, the video course, trading the open, all of that logic. It's just pieces of, you know, how I would have studied the video course a little bit different. Do I treat lunchtime price action differently? Not really. The middle of the day often has a breakout mode. Is often somewhat of a breakout mode because normally you get some sort of, you know, here's an example. You get a sell off in the first part of the open or the opening session. And then you start to go sideways and then the market decides on either trend reversal up or trend resumption down. And that's really common. So you get a breakout sideways and then a reversal or sell off, which would be resumption. Scrolling through some more questions. Okay, profit. So this question about potential partial profits. Shouldn't you hold for more? Let me okay, let me start over. Shouldn't you hold for multiple profit targets? either measured moves or trend lines or point counting. Sure. You know, a lot of traders, if you think about Al, one thing I noticed about Al is he made the comment how he would miss these big moves down and he would be focused on scalping and scalping out. But then what I heard him mention is on daily charts, he was often, he, he will often enter with either some form of a position. So whether that is options, whether that's just selling or buying the underlying, He's not going to short the SPY on a daily chart or short the e on the daily chart, but he might buy puts or he might buy the inverse of the SPY. But he's often short on higher time frames when he thinks the market's going to sell off. But as far as idea for multiple profit targets, I think that's relatively a good idea. And I've talked about this several times, but a good rule of thumb is if you can figure out what the first leg is of a strong breakout, you want to be more aggressive with holding it. So if you get a strong breakout and you know it's the first leg, you know there's at least a 90% chance of a second leg. So you want to be more willing to hold. And that's what that's why when traders buy with limit orders, like they buy the low of seven and they don't get out on eight and nine, they end up just getting completely punished because they, what, they don't, what they don't realize is realistically, we can easily sell off for a long time. So once you think the market's always in short, for me, if you're above the moving average and you get a strong bar to the moving average and then two consecutive bars below it, and it's the it's a really an, it 
the market cycle is starting over, a lot of traders will sell the close, betting on a second leg. And one way to handle that is instead of putting a stop up here, put a stop maybe two bars above somewhere where you look at it and say, if the market goes up here, it's probably not in a strong trend. So traders will trail a stop. And then look, even trailing a stop, maybe a couple of points above this bar or maybe half the range of bar 13, it still goes lower. And then when it triggers above and turns down, traders take profits. So ideally, a lot of traders, what they will do is if you get a sell to close sell off or a micro channel that's lasting eight, nine, 10 bars, it's usually going to become climactic and start to go sideways soon. But even here, if you sell the close all the way down here and your stops all the, <clears throat> all the way up here, do you really think the market's going to go all the way up here before it gets the second leg down? Of course not. So some traders, they'll stay short and they'll wait for, you know, even this right here, probably not going to just completely reverse the price action. So even if you held here, the market still tested lower. So as far as why you should hold for multiple profit targets you should most traders should because what will happen invariably is if a trader sells this close and scalps out here they will not be able to enter and they'll end up missing this entire move there's plenty of traders who will sell the close they'll sell above this high or sell the high and then they'll continue to hold some traders they'll sell all the way down they sell the close at nine, scalp out on 10. They sell the close at 10 or on the pullback of 10, scalp out maybe below 10 or during 11. They sell the close of 11. Maybe they sell more on a pullback and they scalp out. A lot of traders like to enter and exit, enter and exit, enter and exit. And other traders, they'll trade on smaller time frames. But for the most part, a good rule of thumb is whenever you get a strong breakout, until the other side makes money above bars. So if it's a bear breakout, until the bulls make money above bars, it's probably going to be a reasonable, strong move. So I think it's always reasonable, especially, you know, again, that's why I say if you can trade, you know, three or four micros and that's not a problem, that's great. But for a lot of traders, if you're worried about trading one micro, consider trading the SPY. And even if you trade 15 shares or 10 shares, Practice the habit of taking, you know, maybe a third off at a measured move down somewhere down here, and then another third off, maybe at twice your risk, and then just trailing the balance. And then when you get a trend line break and then a retest, consider getting out. That's a very logical thing to do. But <clears throat> the other problem and a simple answer to why traders should hold for a swing, which means multiple profit targets is because a lot of times traders will go for a scalp and they will misread what a high probability trade is. They'll think the high, they'll think the trade is too high. They'll think it's higher probability than what it really is. So they look at 33 and they say, you know, wow, the market's reversing. I'm going to buy the close. What they don't realize is 33 is a strong enough breakout. You're going to get a second leg, but the second leg often will not even be one times the range of the first leg. It might go half the range. And instead of exiting up here, realize, and they fail to realize it's a 20-gap bar sell, they get stopped out all the way down here. Let's take a look at some more questions here. This is a good question. Some of the marked up daily charts that have buy and sell. Yeah, let's just, this might be a fun exercise. So some of the marked up daily charts that have buy and sell PowerPoint rectangular markers tagging them as good trades don't make a scalp. Can you explain? Yeah, he's basically, this person's basically saying some of the scalps that outputs on the end of day charts, some of the stop entries do not end up making money. So I'm assuming this person's asking, why are they even on there? Giving it a second to load. Okay, so let me. If 
by the way, if you're on the if you're logged in, you should have access to the daily archives. I'm gonna go to an old one. Let's just go here. Okay, so let's look. So I'm going to just read the question aloud. Let's find a trading range day. Here we go. This is a good one. So it seems like a lot of these trades here, if you sold here, you get stopped out. If you bought here, you get stopped out. If you bought above here, you lost money. If you sold here, you lost money. So why in the world would Al be selecting these trades? And the reason for that is, see this bar right here? It's hard to see, but if you sold below this bar, do you think this bar, the next bar, is all that disappointing? Do you think that's an exciting bar? If you sold below this second rectangle, which is this big bear bar, if you sold below that and then your next bar is a small doji, are you really thrilled that it's a small doji or are you thinking to yourself, you know, I sold this big bear bar hoping that my entry bar would be another big bear bar. So if it's a small bar, that's a problem. And look at this big bull bar. Do you see what happened? The market sold off and then retested. So I'm going to see, we're going to try something here. I just got to find this. So think about this right here. Think about what happened. We had a spike down. It's really hard to draw with this, which is here. And then, so that's bar one. Then the market pulled back, sold off below the breakout point, and then hesitated right there. So that's bar one, this first line, and then bar two is this smaller line, and then we went sideways, so that's the close of bar two. And then the third line broke down further. So if you think about what's happening is you have a sharp surge in momentum and then hesitation and then a sharp surge in momentum. And what everybody becomes worried of, it's an invariant, it's basically a, it's a, break, it's a spike in channel on a very small time frame. You have this downside move, right right here so a big downside breakout a pullback and then a sell-off in in a channel which is basically a trading range and then a test of the top of the trading range even if you bought above this bull bar right here look what happened disappointed on this next bar you still could have gotten out break even so the point is the answer to your question a lot of these trades don't look great if you buy above this big outside up bar and then the next bar is a disappointing entry bar if you get out break even, the market allows you out. If you sell here and this bar is disappointing, you don't want a big bar with the tail, especially at support. You want a big bar breaking below support. So if the market hesitates, guess what traders do? They scalp out. If you think about why the market even right here, and I'll finish that statement in just a second. If you sold here and this bar was your doji, disappointing, traders get out. If you sell here and then it goes sideways for two bars, traders get out because they see that this breakout test here almost closed. So they expect this one to close. Here, if they sold here and they didn't get out on this big bear bar and the market starts to turn up, they will get out. Anyways, <clears throat> the point with that is if you're selling if you're selling below a bar, you're betting on a breakout. And if you're betting on a breakout, you're hoping for a strong bear breakout. Look at the weekly chart. Do you think it's coincidental that this big bar right here, this big bear one, if traders sold below it and this next bar was basically a disappointment bar, do you think it's a surprise that we hesitated for two bars before we sold off? No. 
traders sold and then they were disappointed. So the market went sideways and then we got a second leg down. That happens on every time frame. So a lot of trades, a lot of stop entries. If you if you can learn to understand that most stop entries do not fail, at least initially, most of the time the market gives you time to exit the trade. So why is that? Because most of the time the market is in a trading range and very close to 50-50. It's very rare for the market to be extremely one-sided. Look at this bar. If you sold below here, pause, it still almost lets you out break even as bad as that trade was. If you sold below 25 here, the market had bad follow through 26 and then follow through 27. It's a two-legged pullback. Leg one, pause on 26, second leg down 27. It's testing the bottom of the channel and then it reversed up. That happens so many times. Exactly. This is, this is, could not have said it better myself. So many trades are logical that fail. Yeah. Every, you know, remember every stop entry has around a 40% chance of being successful, especially in a trading range. And because of that, once the trade starts to fail, trade, you have to accept it and move on and miss and just accept the trade isn't working. Okay. Question. Friday afternoon. So Friday's afternoon session, you mentioned a lot about the test of the blue line. Yeah, so let's let's bring that up. That's a great question. So Friday's afternoon session, I talked a lot about the blue line, which was here. By the way, if whenever you click the trade station it has this feature, this little circle, let me turn this off for a second. Trade station, whenever the chart is squeezed and you change the axis, you can change the axis with this line by dragging it up and down. But anyways, if you want to if you want to get it automatically back the right way, you can click this blue circle. Whenever the chart still feels compressed, that's because you have some sort of if you go to Time, if you go to time frame and customize the symbol and go to scaling, you're going to see this box is checked. Expand range to include studies. And that makes the chart a little bit squeezed. So what it does is it will always show the moving average on the chart when it may not be that needed. Anyways, the blue line that this person was referring to was right here. And I mentioned that I thought the market was going to retest the blue line. And I thought it did. I thought it would. And my point was, I thought it was dangerous to just buy with the limit order down here because how tight the channel was and it was breaking out below the channel here. My other, but my thought was, I thought the odds were high that we'll get back to the blue line. And we started going sideways for a lot of bars channeling down. The channel was fairly tight. And I thought here we would probably get a second leg and test it. But instead, we tested right here at this point. Now, the... Back to the question, you always have to think as far as, you always have to think about a few things. One, you cannot let your own bias control what you're doing. But also, I always think of the market in, form, in terms of the market cycle. So we have a breakout, pause 45, channeling down for a lot of bars. And until we break above the moving average, you always have to think about risk reward. So if you're buying right here, 61, 62, which I thought it was reasonable for the market to rally here. If you do buy, because of the tails, I mentioned that the market could fail somewhere above. And the other thing you have to think about is risk reward. If you're buying here, betting on a test of the blue line and your stops down here, the risk reward is pretty difficult. And then when you get a high one, a lot of traders would get out. I still think we're going to get to this blue line and we'll probably, we may do it Sunday. Maybe we do it on sometime tomorrow early next week but the point is the odds favor bulls buying the blue line scaling and lower and the reason i was saying that was if you're selling down here i thought the selling would be limited so if you sell here you may get a couple of legs down but when you see all these bull bars and every new low getting bought it becomes really really hard to try and sell here because a lot of traders are selling pullbacks I did not see your question and to this person's, the person that asked about the blue line, they said they missed the short of the 20 gap bar, which is part of the, 
ALS trade course. You didn't mention it, though. Is that because you thought the rally was more likely? Yeah, I mean, I'm, <clears throat> my thought was a few things. So I thought over here we would probably get a second leg down and a second leg up. And I mentioned that 63, I mentioned it was a high one buy. And there's probably, and often when you get a high one buy, there's sellers above and the market pulls back and you get a second leg up. So I thought the breakout and follow through was strong enough for at least a brief second leg up. But then here, this bar became so big, I warned that buying a 50% pullback is dangerous because we could easily get, fall below 60 and get a reversal up. So a lot of traders, if they're long and they 64 is already a big enough bar, we'll probably get a second leg down. And then when we got follow through, I thought this is a realistic problem for the bulls. Now look at what happened later in the day. Why do you think we formed a lower high here, sold off, and then finally reached the highs again? For the exact same reason I mentioned about the 63 bulls. The bulls that buy above 63 and buy more, maybe at the new low. Look what this price level is. It's basically break even. The traders who bought the low of 63, it allows them out of the trade. But this is classic of trading range behavior. You have a spike pullback channel, and you can call it a 20 gap bar buy, 20 gap bar sell. There's nothing wrong with that. My problem with selling, there's a few issues. I didn't want to sell at the moving average because I did think realistically we could break to the upside and ignore the moving average and get back to these targets. But also, I didn't want to sell below 63 because it's a bull bar and it would be an outside down, and then if we reversed up, it would be a second entry buy. But then when 64 closed as it did, I mentioned that that's a realistic problem for the bulls. A lot of traders, if you're buying the low of 64, I also, I believe I said, <clears throat> I said that if the market does not fall below 60 or 61, let me back up. I believe I said this, I may not have, but one of the problems with buying this bar is if you have an obvious stop like below 60 or 61, it'll probably fall below it, go sideways, and before it reverses up. And that's what happened here. And then I mentioned that 66, should you sell here? I said, no, the bears probably need more. And then when the, when the 66 closed at its middle, and then 67 was an inside bar, I thought there's probably buyers below for a second leg up. Where can I buy Al's daily reviews? You can buy them. I mean, he used to do it every day in the trading room. So just pick a pick a year. So you can buy, go to brookspriceaction.com and you can buy any just about any year, 2013 all the way to basically 2021 or maybe 2020. Do you prepare the open for specific directional bias? If yes, do you change it during the day and under what conditions? Sure. Remember, I write the blogs every, just about every day. So I, I obviously, I have some directional bias just by looking at the higher time frame. But again, if I'm whenever whenever you're trading, you have to be able to throw your bias out the window. So if you're if you're selling and you're hoping that we're going to break far below 49, but then you start to see 40 bar six and then sideways trading, you have to question if that is really your premise. Here, if you start to go sideways to down and then you see 15 and 16 and you're hoping you're op you're hoping for an early low of the day and a strong rally, but then you see bar 19 and 20. You've got to question your premise. And if your if your premise is questionable, you've got to get out of the trade. Is there another seminar in the future, like in Orlando? Maybe. I hope there will be. But that is a question for Richard. And perhaps maybe he can chime in at some point. But we'll see. I know I am sure that if there was enough interest for another Orlando event, then Al would consider hosting one again. But I think that is up to 
the majority of the people that follow Al. Sometimes Al says probability is 60 or 70%. How can you estimate probabilities from a chart? You can estimate it from, again, there's two ways to estimate probabilities. One is you can, you know, if you're, if you're a quant trader with a bunch of algorithms, then obviously you have a very defined probability and a defined thing that you're doing. But if you're looking at charts, you have to be a little bit more flexible. That's why Al says 60 or 70%. But he's, what he's saying is there's a good enough probability for a second leg. And that's why a lot of trading, you know, trading is, a, is an art in a way, especially if you're just going to be completely discretionary with no rules and just do whatever you want. That's the most difficult way you can trade. And the reality is nobody trades that way. Al doesn't even trade that way. Al's just got so many, you know, let's just say so many plays in his playbook that it just appears that he can trade that way. He understands how to run he understands so many way, different ways to trade and has so many metrics of the way he can trade that it just gives that illusion. But again, you start to realize after you start looking at enough charts, you begin to realize through experience what the probabilities are. Now, there are shorthanded ways you can get around that. And it's what I've been talking about so far with during this session. You can start looking heavily at the open of the day. And what does Al say? You know, if you look at bar 15 and 16, as strong as they are, a good rule of thumb, if you want to measure a breakout, look at the moving average. This bar is breaking out of the moving average, but only 50% of the bar is breaking out above the moving average. And that will lower the probability of the breakout. It's also in a tight, it's in a trading range. So until the market breaks above all the bars to the left, it might just be a buy vacuum in the trading room, in the trading range. Al used to say that he did at least one stupid thing every day trading. Do you find the same thing? Absolutely. I think trading, I think trading is all about doing a lot of stupid things. The longer you trade, the you start doing less stupid things, but also the stupid things you do aren't as catastrophic to what you're doing. And overall, how do you stop? How do you avoid doing dumb things or making mistakes? Dumb things is really just saying, it's really just making mistakes. How you prevent a lot of that is un really understanding and defining what you're doing. So if someone asks, what's your favorite setup? Or, you know, what are you looking for in the chart? If you can't really answer that that well, then that's a problem. If you can't answer, you know, this is the setup I'm looking for. Or if the market does this, I'm going to do that. Or if the market goes up here, I'm going to do that. If you can't define those things that well, then that is an issue and a sign that you're going to be more susceptible to doing dumb things. You know, just if you don't really understand what you're doing, looking at 81 bars in the day is not going to help you. That's why I recommend get really good at trading the open. And the open means waiting for the first hour. So trade after the first hour, learn how to read the opening structure, and then learn how to trade. What's a good rule of thumb to trade five ES contracts? Can you trade it with 25 or 27,000? I think you'll blow your account. I think most people will blow an account trading 25, five E minis with $25,000. That is, you're, you're pretty high. You're pretty, you're very large. You're very much margined at that, at that level. How do you get the chart to show 81 bars and suppose 78? We well, have to make sure you're actually on the Globex. If you show the SPY, a lot of stocks have 78 bars to them. The, a lot of the, the ES.D or the RTH, as others call it, for the E-mini, it has 81 bars. Okay, let me look through some more questions.
Over the summer, I became profitable and had two back-to-back -back green months. Since the schedule change, I'm unable, to, I am struggling to be consistent due to not being able to trade the entire session. See, that last part makes me question what you're doing. I'm struggling to become consistent because I cannot trade the entire session. So what that implies is you need all 81 bars to be profitable. There's something in trading basically called a Z-score. Or you can call it, a, let's just, let's keep it really simple. Let's call it profit factor. So if we think about profit factor, what does that mean? Profit factor is the total gross profit divided by your gross losses. And if you divide that number, you get a, you know, let's say if you win $200, let's just use round numbers. You make $100 and you lose $100 every day. Obviously, your profit factor is zero. But let's say you make $150 and you lose $100 every day. Your profit factor is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is a terrible profit factor because what that means is there's a higher, there's a much higher chance of you destroying your, your quote unquote trading system or what you're doing with your trading. And the reason you're much more willing, you're much more likely to be unable to do what you're doing is because there might be one or two instances that break what you're doing. So if your profit factor, let's say is 10 or five, that's pretty good because obviously, you know, if you're making $500 and only losing a hundred dollars or you're making $600 and only losing a hundred dollars, that's a really good profit factor. And that's a sign that what you're doing is going to last for a long time. But what you don't want to do if you go back to the probabilities and traders equation in the video course and, and go back to the Z score analogy, Al talks about, Al talks about if you had a system with like a Z score of one, basically what he was saying is if you're taking a bunch of trades, if you lose on four trades and on your fifth trade, it's a winner that makes up far more than those four losing trades. What happens if you miss out on that one winning trade? And because of that, you end up not making a winning trade that day, and then you lose on four trades the next day. That means you could have eight winning losing trades in a, in a row. So to answer this person's question, <clears throat> but first a sip of water. The reason I think this is happening to you, if I'm just guessing, I have no idea the way you're trading. But the reason I think this is happening is you're probably taking two, three small losing trades and then you're having one big winning trade that's making up those losses. Or maybe you're taking losses throughout the day and you're trading until you have one big winner that makes you profitable. And because of that, if your winner is later in the day, it would make sense because you don't have time to take that one winning trade later in the day. And therefore, you don't have a winning day. So if you ever you look at your trades, <clears throat> this gets into standard deviations. Everybody's taken statistics where you have a, let's just draw this because this is also something really important to understand. Someone says profit factor has to be at least two. Two is a pretty low profit factor. I mean, uh, it's, it's profitable, but a profit factor of two is not the most ideal. Anyways, back to this person's question. So let's take a bell curve. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be pretty poor with drawing this, but maybe I can be pretty decent. A bell curve, obviously you've got the middle of the curve right here. And that is ideally, Anything in statistics, you know, let's just take trading. You want a large amount of trades to be within this bell curve, ideally perfectly in the middle. They're not going to be perfectly in the middle. It's going to be a little to the right. It's going to be a little to the left. And what you don't want is a bunch of trades out here. So you don't want to have this one trade that is several standard deviations from the mean, which is here. This is the mean. You don't want a bunch of trades out here or here, because what that ends up doing is it makes it very difficult to have a winning system or a winning trading. And what I mean by that is 
if you are trading over the course of a month, everybody who trades is, you have to think of it as a business. And if you're winning business only wins and it's only profitable because it made one decision out of a thousand that ended up working, that's a very dangerous business. And it's probably not going to be in business for several years. It'll probably shut its doors. So what you want to think about is this. If you look at your every, whether it's trade station, any major brokerage is going to have a way to run a report on your trades. And if you have trade station, run trade manager analysis, go to tab two, and you'll see something that talks about coefficient of variance and standard deviation along with mean. Coefficient of variance means how much variance is, is between your average trades. So what that means, what I'm talking about is the more of your trades, you want as many trades as possible to equal about the same profit on every trade. That's a really good sign. So if you can get a high winning percentage and have a lot of three-point scalps just repeatedly, that's a good thing. What you don't want is a bunch of trades that are small winners and then this one really, really big trade that is far different than the others. That's okay if, that's your, if that is what you're trying to do. But I'd be really, this is the sign that you're taking a lot of losing trades in the beginning and having one big winning trade. <clears throat> Everybody has dealt with this situation. And to carry back to, because these are really two, this is the same question. The problem is the reason why you became profitable is you were doing something that was reasonable. And because of that, you know, maybe it was the market cycle. Maybe it was just the way you were trading. You set you at some point you shifted the way you were trading. That's why it's really important. I would work on trading one or two specific ways and getting really good at it. And that will prevent this. And how do you fall back as far as falling back into old habits? Yeah, that you, you, you in essence broke whatever trading strategy you were doing. Everybody has a trading strategy. If you're buying a high one, you're buying a low one or you're fading low ones or you're entering on pullbacks. That's all a trading strategy. Let's take a look at some more questions. Thank you for your time. Sure. I'm happy, excuse me, happy to do all these. How do you get a fund or a prop? How do you get a prop firm? I'm assuming that's what you mean with the price action method. Well, what you're, what you're basically saying is how do you get a funded account trading? I think most traders, I won't go into details with this, but I think most traders are going to be better off just trading their own account. And the first thing they have to do, and everybody thinks that if they can just get more capital or more resources, that is the missing key to trading. It's really not. You know, the reality is, you know, you have to ask yourself, if someone gave you, you know, $100,000 tomorrow to trade with, can you actually do it? Can you do the right thing with that investment? Most traders cannot. So the single best thing most traders can do is to really learn and be confident in what they're doing. A lot of traders, they end up being impulsive and not understanding what they're doing. And that leads to being unable to do the right thing day after day. So how do you what I would really work on is getting really consistent with one or two types of setups and really, really comfortable with those setups. And then once you do that, start working on other setups. And other setups could be trading the middle of the day, trading the end of the day, trading breakouts, trading second legs. Then you'll become more and more confident in what you're doing. And when you become more and more confident in what you're doing, you can start putting more, more and more money aside to trade with. Question, I wait only for 30 minutes after the open. Isn't that enough? Waiting for one hour seems to miss a lot of volatility. Well, I would, it's, that's a personal question. I would just ask yourself to ask yourself, how is, the first hour, is it benefiting you or damaging your trading? If it's benefiting you, then go for it. I think most traders will do better. Most traders are probably in this boat. Let me see if I can find this person's question again. 
most traders are probably in this camp right here. They become profitable and what ends up happening is there's either they're either making money in the beginning and then they keep trading and losing it or they lose money in the beginning. They get chewed up through here and then they finally, you know, sell here, get a second leg and make a profit. But I I would say you're probably still going to be better off if you can wait for at least six to 12 bars and you're, you're going to learn. You're not really going to miss out on that much. To continue with the question answered previously from someone else. 27, well, for a $27,000 account is five contracts too big. And what's the best size? Well, you have to think about the from standpoint from a calculator. So 27, let's just say, let's just do the math. So if we have 27,000 risking 5% of your account, 1350, you really want to risk 1350. I say that because if you're trading, let's say your risk is, let's look over here. I'm going to sell the close of, let's say this bar right here. And the close is 77. Change the theme really quick. By the way, I like the theme, file themes and choose the light. I like it because it's really easy to see the bars anyways, or it's easy to see the data window. If you sell the close of this bar, your entry is 77.5. And if you put your stop a couple of points above, you know, let's say you put your stop 10 points above, 10 points above would basically be the high of this bar. So if you're risking 10 points times 50, it's $500 times five, that's $2,500 for five contracts. $2,500 on $27,000 is 9% risk. So if you screw up in three trades, you have lost 30%. The reality is, if twenty-seven thousand dollars, I think most traders, I think most traders are going to get in trouble if they start risking more than one percent per trade, especially when they're starting out. And because of that, most traders should not do that. And and the way you figure out again, how do you figure out risk of ruin and what you can trade? It's it's relatively simple. But you have to figure out, you know, everybody says how much money is enough. And they're really not answering the right question. Yes, there is a number. So if we go back to that calculator and we take a $50,000 account, 0 0.01, obviously that's $500 per trade. So 1% is $500. And that's good. We know what 1% is. But what you have to factor in and really think about is, Okay, but what is the setup? What's the probability? What's the frequency of the trade? So if the probability is 80%, then sure, you can risk 1%. If the probability, and that also gets into risk reward as well, but if the probability is 40%, then risking 1% is a lot, is really not that ideal. So it gets a lot into, the more you can define exactly what trade you're taking, then the better you know what you can risk. So as far as is 50K enough, it varies on the trades you're taking. If you can take high probability trades, then you can get by, you can risk more, especially if you have a way to get out. So if you have a high probability and your, if your probability is high and on average, your, your risk or your loss is less than your reward, that is a fantastic thing. How to use the one hour chart? You can glance at it, but again, I would practice focusing on the one minute chart. Is it better to choose from one or two default sizes rather than cons constantly adjusting sizes for each trade? Absolutely. Most traders are better off choosing one or two default sizes for that particular, the particular way they're trading.
And a lot of traders just have one or two sizes for the entire way they trade. Have you ever had three trades in a row that fell into a trap? You did the right thing, but you were forced to close your trade with a loss? Sure. How likely is it that we will fall into a trap several times in a row? And what's the best thing to do in such cases? Well, again, what that comes in, what that gets into is understanding what you're doing. You know, if you listen to Al, Al calls it the pain trade. You know, he even says that there's there's a realistic number. Even if you take high probability trades, you can get trapped X number of times. If you listen to Ali a lot, he talks about calibrated expectancy. And what that basically means is expectation of the trade. It's just more of a, you know, an engineering mindset, if you will. But Al even ta Al talks, Al Brooks talks about the exact same thing. And what it means is you have to have an expectation behind the trade. If you know what the market should do, you'll be better prepared to react when the market does not do what you think it should do. So as far as if you, if you take high probability trades and you get trapped three times in a row, it's probably due to an error on, on you. You probably misread something about the market, but it is statistically possible to get trapped two or three times in a row. Sure. What do you think about funded companies like Apex and your threshold system for $2,500 in a 50K account? In my opinion, if you know where to scale in, like BTC is almost certain success. Yeah, I think it I think it largely depends on the person. You know, my only, you know, the only comment I would make with this is you are dealing with there's several pieces and you know, I won't go into a lot of it. You know, I don't think Apex is bad or any of them really bad. You know, they're they're telling you exactly what the the rules are. But I think most traders, it's very easy for traders to fall prey of funded accounts just because they know they can pay a couple hundred dollars and you know it's free money. So worst case, they lose a couple hundred bucks, and best case, they get funded and they make money from it. My only concern with a lot of this is I think it's easy for traders to overtrade and in part, you know, the reality is most traders would be better off studying and really thinking through what they're doing. And on top of that, if you're trade, you know, why not just put a little bit of money aside monthly and you're going to be in a better spot, but do funded companies work? Sure. I have no reason to assume that they don't work. However, I think there's things you have to be very careful about prop firms. You know, prop firms, they're betting that you fail. Whether you like it or not, they are taking the opposite side of what you're doing. They hope that you're going to fail. And it's a numbers game. The reality is there's far more unprofitable traders than profitable traders. And because of that, if you have... You know, let's say a thousand traders trading you, paying you 50, 60 bucks a month or a hundred bucks a month, you're obviously making money. And as long as you have the technology and the infrastructure built, your overhead is not that high. And then even if, I mean, if you think about their model, even if you're paying them, let's say, however much, even if someone gets a funded account and they are profitable for months and months and months, and therefore Apex is or whatever firm is losing money, if they really believe in the trader, who knows, maybe they start paying them, you know, some kind of fee for the real money. But I don't know, I don't want to get into too much with that, because, you know, there's technically, I, I haven't read enough about prop firms and how regulatory wise it works. And if you're asking, you know, I'm sure there's, there's probably some regulatory reason as to why. And they, <clears throat> anyways, I don't want to. I don't want to go too far down that that rabbit hole. But long story short, I would be 
I think most traders are probably better off just trading with their own money. But I'm sure there's plenty of traders that have used prop firms and they've worked just fine. I think the most important thing is making sure you're studying and knowing what you're doing. It varies. I know some prop firms trade simulated and, you know, I'm sure, I mean, there are, I mean, sure, if you go to Chicago, there are plenty of prop firms that out there that you can try out for that they will give you real money to trade with, but you're going to have to have a really good track record before they invite you to the table. And for most traders, again, I would go back to the video course studying and just focusing on getting very proficient with what you're doing that is the best thing you can do you know be your own prop firm you know take your capital trade it yourself and get really good at what you're doing but there's also nothing wrong if you feel confident in what you're doing sure sign up for a prop firm and test your knowledge but you have to be just smart about what you're doing that's the best advice i can give you do you consider two times actual risk? Do you consider a gain of two times actual risk? And after that, do you put it to rest the rest of the contracts in at the entry price? I guess you're asking, do I move my stop? For me, it varies on what the chart's doing. The longer you trade, the more you'll react to the price action. So a lot of traders, yes, everybody, a lot of traders know if they sell here, stop up here, 60% chance you're going to get a measured move down. But a lot of traders, instead of doing that, they know the odds are it's going to go sideways for a lot of bars. So they start wanting, they don't want to hold through all this. So they end up selling, maybe scaling in, scalping out, low one short, buying below, scalping out, selling above here, maybe taking profits below 24 or buying below 24 and scalping out. And then when they get 30 or 31, they start selling again. A lot of traders, they like two-sided trading the longer they trade. Most traders should use a smaller stop. You know, you can use a wide stop, but I think you, the problem with wide stops is if you don't understand, let's use an example. So if you, if you buy the close of seven, 16 here, stop below 15, and you think there's a 60% chance the market's going up, you have to realize when that probability is changing. And when it is changing, you have to have a way to you have to have a way to exit the trade. So if you're, if you're taking a one-to-one -one risk reward trade, you have to be willing to cut your loss at some point. So if the probability, let's say it's 60%, you're going to get a measured move. At some point here, it's a little bit lower. And then maybe here, it's a little bit lower. And then a high one buy at the top of the range, probably sellers above. There's really no, there's no longer a 60% chance you're going all the way up here. So a lot of traders tighten their stop, tighten their stop and if the high one fails, they start to exit. And that's why traders got out on 19. Okay, so I've got time for a couple more questions, and then I'm going to wrap this up. In the future, I'm going to start doing, you know, I really want to start doing Q&As and having an actual discussion on one, of the on one of the videos in the Brooks Trading Course. So I'd be curious, who can give me, let's take a quick poll in the video course, in out of the video course, what would be a what would be a topic that traders would like to have discussed more from the video course? In other words, out of all the videos in the video course, is there a certain section, major trend reversals, breakouts, or trading ranges, or trading in trading ranges? Is there a particular subject that we, that you guys would like to have a discussion on? And obviously, just so everybody is on the same page, trading psychology will be one of them. I know Richard has talked about wanting to do that. Always in trade management reversals. That's good. Trading the open. Major trend reversals. I think it'll major trend reversals will definitely be one of the first ones. I will talk about always in, but that might be down the road as well. 
Trading the open, okay. Trading the open. So a lot of people are trading trading the open in breakouts. Well, what I think we'll do in the future is we will send a link through this platform. It's called StreamYard that allows it to be streamed to YouTube. So what we will probably do for those that are not on the Brooks Trading Course, for those that are members of the Brooks Trading Course and have the video course, what we'll probably do for the next one is actually send out a email with the link to the members of the Brooks Trading Course. And because of that, because obviously, if we're going to talk about pieces of the Brooks Trading Course, you need to be a member and have actually paid for it in order to listen to that, because that would be fair to everybody else. So what we'll do next time is probably send out a link from the list of people who have ordered, who have purchased the Brooks Trading Course, and we'll actually go more in depth over topics from the trading course. So trading the open, maybe we can pull up the slides and really start talking about them and getting to where we can answer questions about trading the open. So if Al has three or four bullet points on trading the open, maybe we can dive further into those. Okay, so market cycle, that's good. It'll probably be the market cycle. That might be one of the first videos. What's a, first, what's a good trading strategy? I like always in, but always in is comprised of a bunch of trading strategies. Most traders should get really good if you want to know one of the best trading strategies to probably figure out, figure out a breakout in a second leg. So a breakout that's strong enough to have a second leg, especially if the breakout is in the first leg, that's a very good trading strategy. Okay, so I'm going to look at a few more questions. I do appreciate the comments about what to look for or the comments as far as videos they would like for us to be talked about. It's just called StreamYard. That's just the platform. But that's not that important to know. I have more winners than lo than losers, but when I lose, I lose big and end up eating all my winners. What advice would you have? Yeah, that's just a simple... Your, your probability is very high, but the issue is your risk is so big that when you lose, it offsets all your winners. And that's a problem a lot of traders have. And the, tr the trick is you have to find a way to, to lower your losers. You cannot have a high probability. In general, a good rule of thumb is you every trade, any losing trade should be able to be recouped or made up within at least three or four bars, three or four chart, three or four trades, winning trades. So if you have a loser and it takes 10 trades to make up that loser, that's a very bad trading strategy because what will end up happening is you have to be 90% profitable realistically just to break even. You need, and that's why I'd say it's it's really dangerous for traders to ha to trade to have a reward that is half their risk because what ends up happening is they need the probability to be really, really high in the 80s or 85% just to make it worthwhile. Could you give more advice on the topic for discussion so we could review the relative relevant videos? Sure. So let's just all, I'm going to give a vote between three videos that's, that was talked a lot about or that was requested a lot. So major trend reversals, market cycle, or the always in videos. So if you've seen the video course, you have the market cycle videos, the major trend reversal videos, or 
the always in videos. So if you had to vote, you know, which out of those would you like to see for the next session? Let me know and then we will that will be the next video. So I'm going to give a couple of seconds for people to start commenting on that and then we'll tally up and see which one it'll be. And we'll still do all three of those at some point, but just for the start. And I really think it should be the market cycle. But I'll let you guys decide first. Of course, everyone's saying always in. I'm not going to do trading in the open for the first one. So either major trend reversals, always in, or market cycle. So let's see. Looks like market cycle is going to win. And I think that's really the best video series to talk about. So I'm hoping you know, maybe next week, and by next week, I mean like the end of next week. It will not be in the next few days. I'm hoping, and we'll send out an advanced email, and I'll put it in Discord. But if you are a member of the trading course, let's plan on having a video series on market cycle where we can really talk and answer questions about the market cycle. So I'm going to think through that and spend some time really thinking through the market cycle and thinking of how the best way to discuss that. And I would ask anybody that wants to watch it for one, you have to have, you have to have purchased the video course. So this will not just be on YouTube streamed live. It will be, there will be a private link more likely than not to the people who own the video course. And obviously we ask that you don't share the link. You know, the video course is only, for 100 plus hours, I think it's like 120 hours. It's about, I think it's 300 bucks, 350 bucks. So if you do the math, I mean, let's just do the math there. I could be totally wrong. Well, let's just look here, just out of curiosity. I'm going to log out. I'm pretty sure the Brooks Trading Course is. Let's just see. Okay, so it's $400. So if it's $400, and let's just say it's 100 hours, I mean, that's basically $4 an hour. So out of respect for Al and Richard, because they both worked tirelessly to build the video course, don't share the private link out if you own the course to other people. But anyways, with that said, that those of you that own the course, you are on the mailing list. So the depending on what email you use, just keep an eye out, you know, just be sure and check that email. And, um, and hopefully next week we'll give advance notice, but we'll send out an email to that mailing list for a video. And we'll talk about the market cycle. Can anybody who purchased the video course, join the discord? Sure. The discord, I think I found it the other day, at least how to go to it from the Brooks trading course, but you can, I believe if you go to, it's not blog, is it blog? It's not there. There's a section, there's somewhere where it shows all of the, Shows like the Facebook page and the Discord. I wonder if we just type in Discord, maybe it'll pop up. Okay, so if you go to the Brooks Trading Course, click search, type Discord. At least you can click on rows right here, this Brooks Trading Room Enhancement. And if you scroll down somewhere here, you'll see the Brooks Trading Course Discord link. That'll at least, you know, that's at least a workaround. Anyways, keep an eye out for that and 
you know, at least a couple of days before the the webinar over the market cycle, will you'll have at least a couple of days notice. But go ahead and really watch the videos on market cycle and really start thinking about the market cycle. How is the video course different from the books? Well, it's it's just easier to understand it from someone who's in the beginning. It's you know, I would think about it like this. It's kind of like having a classroom where if you're watching the video course, it's kind of like having a teacher explain it to you versus reading a book. It's really that simple. But both are very good. Is the whole point always in if you had to pick one side, you would pick? Yeah, I mean, the point of always in is picking whatever direction you had to choose. That's the always in direction. So being unsure about always in is kind of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? Well, always in, if it's clearly always in long, you know, that's the difference between if it's in a trend or a trading range here, it's clearly always in short. I don't want to, I don't want to buy. That's why I said in the trading room here, it's really better not to buy with a limit order because the channel down is tight here. When I'm in it, when the market's in a tight trading range, I'm paying more attention to counting legs. So it's always in short on bar four. Yes, but. I don't want to necessarily buy at the bottom of a trading range. And if I did sell, I don't want to sell at the bottom of a trading range. And if I did, and bar five is bad follow through, it's disappointing follow through. It's a weak bear bar. I'm going to be pretty quick to get out. And if I didn't get out, I'd probably get out on a retest. But overall, the more it's in a trading range, the more you want to be careful about selling too low or buying too high. So yes, you have to be very careful with trading always in, in a trading range. And yes, you can purchase, you can join the discord, even if you have not purchased the video course, but it's really not that beneficial. I'd purchase the video course. And I'll put, we'll put, we'll put notice in discord as far as when the next YouTube stream when the next when the market cycle webinar discussion will be but it'll probably be about seven days from now Okay, reading through questions. When we have an unsustainable, exhaustive trend that continues to move forward and does not stop at all, how should we trade? Well, you used a key word there, unsustainable and exhaustive. So you know what I'm going to say. Unsustainable and exhaustive is climactic behavior. That happens a lot in trading ranges right here. You start to get a micro channel. So then I talked, I think I talked about this in the trading room. And if I didn't, or in one of the end of day videos, but when you get a micro channel that lasts a lot of bars, like nine bars, 10 bars, eight bars, especially in a trading range, usually it's not going to last all that much longer. So why is that? Because when you start to get a four or five bar micro channel, traders look at this and they want to sell a pullback. They want to enter on a pullback, but the market's forcing them to sell at new lows. And if it keeps doing that, eventually the odds start to favor a pullback and a reversal especially in a trading range because traders are forced to chase the market down. And because of that, everybody starts to take profits faster. It becomes unsustainable. Okay, let me look for some more questions. So looking for maybe one or two more questions.
By the way, as far as on the open, I would at least wait for bar six. I forget what it was. I think it's bar. Yeah, on the open or close of bar six, open of seven, there's often a big report. There's a report bar, so it's pretty common. And usually it doesn't move the market too much, but sometimes you can get a, you know, something surprising. I'm not really finding what I'm looking for. How did I come across Al's trading strategy? I found his blue book around 2013, I believe. I can't remember. It was either beginning of 20. It was really 2012, actually. No, it was sometime 2013. I think it was in the beginning of 2013 when I found Al's blue book. And I liked the blue book because it was just really about price action. You know, there wasn't any real indicators. It was just very... Al discussing a chart and then shortly after I found his volume series of books and that was kind of it. Do I pay attention to pre-market? Yes. I am aware of the pre-market price action. I find it difficult to identify always in during trading range days. I would like to trade in the direction of always in, but in trading range days, I often find myself trapped. Any advice? Yeah. A good rule of thumb is this is if there's one thing that people should write down, it's this. Always never fade leg one and never trade the third leg of a move. Obviously, there's exceptions, but it's a good rule of thumb. So what does that mean? There's a video that cert that if you've ever listened to an interview with Al Lee, he talked about in the highest probability thing in trading that he found was a breakout leading to a second leg. And the only reason I say that, and now it says the same thing. It's just the only reason I'm saying that is leg one always leads just about always leads to a second leg so if you have a leg one can be identified as here's the market cycle tight trading range and then we broke out to the upside so that's leg one al would call that a surprise bar surprises have second legs so traders buy the low of the bar and they get a second leg because of that it's very dangerous it's extremely dangerous to fade that second leg so if you just in, in trading ranges or when you're trading, never fade the first leg. And then after you get two or three legs up, here's a breakout, but it might reset the count. So that's a leg one. And then maybe this reset the count, but then you get leg two, maybe leg three. Don't trade this because it's going to be leg three. In a trading range, that's even more important. So let's look here. I'll just find something that's just really a mess. Here's this rally. 27, 28, that's leg one. Pull back, this breakout is leg two. And then we pulled back to here. This breakout's leg three. Don't trade this third leg because there's a really high probability of the market retracing to the bottom of the third leg. Even when the market's in leg two, it can be very dangerous if the market's in a trading range to scale in below leg two. So a lot of trading, the secret to trading, a lot of things, one of the big secrets with trading is, is leg counting. When you get a strong leg, pull back, and maybe a second leg, don't buy it. The other thing about breakouts is if you go back to Al's trend book and start reading about tra the trend book with signal bars, when you get a big breakout bar that's overlapping a lot of bars to the left, it's really dangerous to buy that bar. So when you see a big bar like this and then bad follow through, be really, really careful about buying. You're better off waiting for more follow through. And then if you do buy and you see the market starts to pull back kind of aggressively, just exit the trade. And then the other thing is, I know I'm not really answering your question, but if you get a strong bar with follow through and it looks like it's reversing something strong, in other words, you look at bar 10 and 11 and you think, yeah, that should have had a second leg and it didn't. 
the odds are you're going to get another leg down. So leg one, pull back, leg two. But as far as always in and trading range days, it's what I talked about. Trading range days, it's very important not to sell low. And even more important, don't sell a third leg down or a second leg down in a trading range. So when you have a lot of trading range price action, like here, if you're selling down here, it's dangerous because this might be the first pause. That might be the second pause. That might be the third. And high on, on leg three, high probability of testing the top of the leg. Here, why not sell here? Because it could easily still be one, two, three pushes down. And then if you do sell at the bottom of the range and you get a bull bar, it's usually better just to get out. Look for a few more questions here. As far as stop placement, that should be, that's a good, there's not enough time to really talk about it, but most traders should use a price action stop and just trade small enough relative to the stop. But that should be, that would be a good, you know, I'll say a few things with price action stops. Let's find one. A good rule of thumb is whenever the market is in, Whenever the market is in a small pullback trend like this and it's selling off, a lot of traders, instead of putting a stop, in theory, the theoretical stops all the way up here. But the reality is there's a certain distance. If you're short and the market goes up a certain distance, you're going to get two legs up. So a lot of traders, they'll sell and they'll put a stop maybe above the prior bar especially if it's a big bar, they'll put a stop, maybe a couple of ticks or a point or two above the prior bar, and they'll take a chance. And their premise is, as long as the market stays in a small pullback trend, the market should not allow, in this case, bulls to make money above bars. So if stop order bulls make money, the trend is over and it's evolved into a trading range. So it's kind of like here. If, if someone's short and then all of a sudden stop order bulls make money here, that's a warning that the trend's over. You could still test the extreme, the bottom of the range, but more likely than not, the trend is going to be over. Here, look what happened. It's a small pullback trend. Traders buy the close, and they just put a stop maybe a couple of points below any bar, and they trail it. And when you start to get a lot of overlap, it looks like it's a channel, and it's going to break to the downside. But you have to realize traders are not making money. So instead of being long and putting a stop all the way down here, there's some directional limit. You know, maybe it's four or five points below any bar. But if the market sells off far enough, everybody's going to get out and it'll lead to another leg down. So rather than staying long, traders just put a stop. You know, maybe it's a stop, a measured move below this bar. So maybe it's at the moving average. And their premise is if this is going to be a trend, it should not sell off all the way down here before we get a second leg. And you can see what happened in this case, it broke above the channel. But anyways, I'd love to talk more about that question, but there's just, there's a lot of pieces to that question. Okay. For always in short, is it a good idea to throw sell limits out 
on bulls buying for scalps? Sure. So think about what you're saying. What you're saying is, like in here, well, in this case, these didn't trigger, so let's not use that. But let's find a really, like right here. Let's look at bar 60. Does 60 look like a great sell below the bar? Of course not. You have a buy climax bar on 59, but a very tight channel. So what's the real, what, you know, if you think about it, what's the odds that the market's going to go all the way down here before the market goes up here? The reality is, if you buy below this bar, the odds are you're probably going to go somewhere up here before you go way down here. And trying to find other examples of that if you are, you know, even here. Always in short, maybe four bars down, but tight bull channel. The odds are the first reversal up is probably going to fail. So if you sell above the four high, it's probably not going to go that far up before it goes back down. And see what happened? The market went above and turned down. A good example of what you're asking is bad low one shorts. And we had a good one on 48 yesterday or Friday. 48 to low one short. And on 48 right here, if you buy the low of this bar, the reality is it's a very bad limit order. It's a, it's a bad stop entry short. Bad stop entry shorts are always great limit order buys. And great stop entries are terrible limit orders. I know this person keeps moving. They keep asking for bars. The problem is when, you're, when we're doing these live streams, there's a slight delay as to, as to when the question's asked. So it's about a five or six second delay. So that makes it a little bit challenging. But anyways, as far as when the market is clearly bearish, can you fade stop entries? Of course you can. So three, let's find an example. Like right here, these bull bars, why are traders fading them? Because they see the channel being tight and limit order traders selling. I have a problem identifying trading ranges. Well, the good news is hopefully next week, so maybe next weekend, or maybe probably next Monday, but anyways, maybe seven or eight days from now, I want to talk about the market cycle. So this would be a great question regarding the market cycle. Does the type of bar, bull or bear, have any significance in high one or low one signals? As in, would it help if a high one is a bull bar? Certainly. More importantly, what matters is the context of the market. So bar six, low one short. It's not a great low one short, but it's not terrible because the, the breakout to bar four is so strong, odds are you're going to get a second leg down. But bar 11 that's a terrible low one short. You're clearly in a trading range, and the odds are the market's going to rally and go sideways. If we look at, let's say, let's find a better one. Bar 50 right here, this high one. It's not a terrible high one buy. It's near this trading range price action here, but the channel is so tight. We might pull back a little bit, but chances are if you buy above this bar and scale in, you'll make money. And you could see what happened. It triggered the buy, pulled back, and still ended up going sideways to up. I want to find a strong, you know, even this bear bar right here. Chances are there's buyers above, even if the market pulls back. And that's because the breakout is strong. All right, so that's all the time I really got. But stick around for more information on the market cycle discussion. And as far as tomorrow... Let's just go ahead and look and see. Looks like the 30th is tomorrow. So Tim and Rose talk in the trading room tomorrow. And then 31st, Rose and I will talk. But other than that, as far as the daily chart goes, because of the tail on last Friday in the tight bear channel, 
I suspect we're probably going to start to pull back. So I think we're probably going to try and test at least 4,200 in the next couple of days. But we will see. All right. Hope everyone has a good rest of their day. And there will be there will be an end of day review on YouTube tomorrow when the market closes. All right. Hope everyone has a good rest of their day. Thank you.